Well, hello again. Our, uh, our final session this afternoon is on Western aid and news media assistance, addressing the question of what is needed now. The program will be moderated by Nolan Bowie, who is an assistant adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, a faculty affiliate of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, and a senior fellow of the Shorenstein Center on Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Nolan's primary policy concerns focus on equity and fairness in the allocation of and access to information in all formats through digital and analog communications technology. But most important to us at the Neiman Foundation is that he helped select the 2008 class of Neiman Fellows and his courses are among the most popular with the Neiman Fellows. Nolan? Thank you. And your panel? Um, good afternoon. Um, I have both uh, bad news and good news. I'd like to start with the bad news. And that is uh, one of our panelists, um, a key person, Sarah Mendelson, uh, who is the Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Bureau of Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance at USAID, would not be with us today. Um, because of illness, uh, but part of the good news is that uh, it gives us more time uh, to uh, speak um, and sort of uh, say what she may have said if she had come. Um, and um, the other part of the good news is that we have uh, two very distinguished um, uh, experts to speak about uh, aid and assistance to um, Western aid and assistance to media uh, enterprises and journalists, and raising the question as to what is needed now. Um, I would begin by asking the first question, what is now? And who's asking the question as to what is needed? Um, I have a number of questions, uh, which is sort of uh, consistent with the way I teach. Uh, by background and training, uh, I'm a, uh, an, an attorney, and I teach with the uh, Socratic method. And I, and I'd like to begin by uh, quoting an old ditty that you're probably all aware, uh, that he who pays the piper calls the tune. Uh, that is a uh, truism in certain circumstances, but I'd like to uh, raise the uh, question as to whether or not that applies here uh, when Western um, uh, organizations or government agencies provide funding or assistance to uh, journalists in Eastern Europe uh, in post-communist uh, regimes. Um, also, I have a number of other questions which I think uh, may be answered, or I'm hoping that will be uh, answered or at least raised uh, by our uh, commenters. Uh, how are the needs of foreign journalists and investigative reporters uh, determined in the first place? And uh, considered uh, for uh, by whom? Under what standards? Um, what are the uh, terms and conditions, if any? Are there any uh, overt or covert um, uh, expectations? Um, if, in fact, uh, one of the goals is to fund an increasing amount of independent journalism and content, um, if uh, a reporter or a journalist were to sort of bite the hand of the funder, can they expect future funding? Um, there are three ways generally in which governments traditionally try to control or regulate or influence uh, speech content or publication. Uh, one is uh, direct content controls, to either tell uh, an enterprise or a person what to say, what they can say, or what they can't say. Uh, that comes close to uh, unlawful censorship uh, in many uh, countries. The other two uh, uh, include uh, structural regulation, uh, defining in advance um, who can own what, how much, uh, and under what uh, circumstances, either through licensing or through uh, um, adjudication through antitrust uh, or antitrust-like uh, laws. And the third is what is the subject of the instant uh, panel, uh, and that is um, the provision of subsidies. Uh, in the United States, uh, the licensing of broadcasters uh, with the free license is a big subsidy. 
We are all aware of uh, public broadcasting getting an annual subsidy, um, but also in terms of uh, provision of uh, public schools, public libraries, uh, public galleries, uh, and the like, are all means of uh, providing uh, some subsidy to uh, content. Um, so the, the question now is, uh, who subsidized whom, for what reasons, um, under what circumstances, uh, what is the process like, uh, and how do we go about accounting what metric is used to measure either success or failure of these particular programs and entities. Um, our first speaker, um, I think, uh, will be uh, Jerome uh, Omenti, who is Distinguished Professor Emeritus, School of Communications, Information, and Library Studies at Rutgers University, and was a 1968 Neiman Fellow. Uh, to n learn more about him, I suggest you read the uh, second page of the uh, program. And he will be followed by uh, Peter Gross, who is Professor and Director of the School of Journalism and Electronic Media, College of Communications and Information, University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Um, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, Carol also s threw a bunch of questions at us too, and and with your questions, I feel like I'm going into my uh, doctoral exam. But uh, <laughs> see, we'll see what happens. Uh, actually, what I would like to do is uh, maybe systematically go through some of those questions and, and at least lay out a, an index of, of some of the issues that uh, we have experienced. When I say we, I'm talking about my colleague Peter, Peter Gross and uh, others who have done uh, media training assistance overseas. Uh, I've been overseas about 175 times since 1989 and have done a lot of work in, uh, in Europe, mainly in Central and East Europe and Russia. Uh, and it's more recently in the Middle East, um, previously in, in Latin America, and, and then we'll be starting some work in, in uh, Mozambique in, a few, in another month or two. Uh, I'm also hoping in the conversation that we have after our, our little spiel here that uh, we can address some of the concerns that, Max, uh, that uh, Stefan raised, and that is... Uh, the people who, who parachute in, in their red, white, and blue parachutes, and spend a week or two and then disappear. Uh, and, they may, and they may, in fact, help, and in many other ways they may be a real danger, and we have to, we have to address that. But uh, one of the first questions I was asked to address was, uh, how do we determine the needs of, of international journalists? Uh, and I think uh, it goes to, a little bit to what, Mac, Mac, what Stefan was talking about. Uh, if, if someone is going to be serious about uh, working in, a, in another culture, they have to commit themselves to a long-term long -term, uh, commitment to be there. Uh, in our case, back in 1989, after the election of Solidarity, uh, we were asked to... Uh, actually, I was called down to Washington and said, what should we do? And basically, the first, the first response I had was, I think we ought to really do some careful studying of what are the, what are the needs of, of, of Poland before we start doing any kinds of programs. So one of the first things that I did was to do a, a long media needs assessment in Poland and then also one in the Czech Republic. And then at, at that point it was part, part of Czech, Czechoslovakia. So it was both the Czech Republic and Slovakia. But it was really important for me to go in there and spend a couple of weeks talking to journalists, to editors, to people from the universities, uh, people from the Samazat, the underground publications, uh, and really get a sense of uh, what their needs were. And I remember one journalist that who was a really well-respected journalist in, in Poland, and actually I think may have been a former Neiman, uh, and he said to me, Jerry, we know the skills, we know the techniques of how to do reporting and editing. So the problem is that for the last 20 years, We've been interviewing on our knees. And he was really talking about the need to change attitude, to change uh, uh, the whole sense of, of how, to, how does a reporter-editor deal with his sources and how does he deal with 
threats and, and things like this. So basically, if, if I were talking about how to determine the needs of foreign journalists, I think it's really important that you start with a very careful media needs assessment and you spend time there to get a sense of what it's all about. The next thing we did right away was to do a series of short workshops. We, had a, we were sort of like the uh, flying Walendas. We were in a panel truck going around to 10 different cities in Poland. I had with me uh, some really good seasoned journalists from print and broadcast. And basically what we would do is to do a one-day workshop, a two-day workshop, then move to the next area. But we were using the workshops not only to talk about uh, um, a media performance and, and, and techniques, but we were also using it as a sounding board so that we were getting, as we traveled to all parts of Poland, we were able to get uh, feedback on, again, what was needed. The other thing that I think is really important is that you develop long-term roots that uh, you can't go in there, hit, and run. I think that uh, in our case, uh, we spent, I probably was back to Poland about 40 times, and we set up a, 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 a media center in Warsaw. Uh, it, was, it was staffed by people who uh, were indigenous uh, people in the area, uh, Poles who were a specialist that we worked with, set up the center, set up the resources. The other thing that we did was to work at Jagiellonian University in Krakow and help them to create a new uh, school of journalism. Uh, in Warsaw, we found that we couldn't really work too well with the Warsaw University people. Uh, and rather than spend a lot of time doing that, we, we created the center outside, and then we eventually started working with the, with the university. Uh, another thing that we found that was important was to focus on young reporters. There were a lot of young people who had come out of that underground press uh, or who were, were working in it. Uh, and we gradually started uh, doing this kind of, of, of contact work. Uh, we started out, in, we had a range of courses that started out in terms of, of fundamentals of reporting. Then we started moving through more uh, specialized kinds of reporting. And then we started talking about uh, uh, joint collaborative projects. So I think out of all of that, one of the uh, things that I feel is really important when, if we start talking about continuing this work or starting to do it in other parts of the world, uh, we have to have a, lo a long-term commitment in terms of who the people are who are running this program and the people who are involved in it. That means not only a commitment of time, but a commitment of funding. Uh, most of the funding that I see uh, coming out on these programs is hampered by the fact that everyone comes in and they want to buy a racehorse and let the horse run, but they don't stay for the race. And, and I think that what we need to do is over a period of time to really have a, uh, a commitment on the part of the funding sources, and I'll talk about who they are in a little bit. Uh, we need a commitment on the part of the funding sources to really, to really say, yes, we're going to stay in this for a couple of years or whatever, whatever it takes for us to do this. And, at the, at, and all along the way to be saying, how do we create our exit strategy so if it's the U.S. or Britain or whoever it happens to be, we're in and out of there. Uh, in terms of who is doing the, the, the media assistance funding, uh, a lot of it is, is happening out of State Department in the United States. A lot is happening out of AID, which is sort of integrated with, with State, uh, IRX. The uh, Soros Foundation and the Open Society did some really good and important work early on. Uh, there was a lot of really good work being done by Great Britain, by France, by Germany uh, during those post-solidarity days. Uh, and then I was asked what kinds of things were funded. And, and basically, uh, the training was probably uh, at the top of the list. But uh, there were also other kinds of programs. We, we're talking about cultural exchange. There are a lot of international visitor programs that, in fact, uh, are doing some really good work in terms of bringing journalists over here to, uh, from different countries to uh, spend up to two to three weeks, up to several months. Uh, Gazette of Aborcia was, was mentioned several times as a, as a good example of a success in Poland. Uh, we, we had worked with them. Uh, we had editors from, uh, from Gazetta come to Rutgers and spend a year 
of study with us. Uh, we, at one point, they said, look, we need help with our ethics, uh, our ethics uh, guidelines. And rather than dump on them the, uh, the usual, you know, do the SPJ, Society of Professional Journalist Ethics or whatever, we said, let's spend some time with you and then help you write a code of ethics. And what we did was, uh, with Helena Luciva, uh, she took all 26 editors, there were regional, regional papers all around Poland of, of Gazeta. She took the 26 editors and we said, we want, we'll, we want to go for away for a weekend and we want you to bring at least one problem of ethics that you've confronted as an editor at your regional paper. We were able to do that. I had Jane Kirtley with me. Jane is uh, uh, now at, uh, I think at, at, at Wisconsin, but she was head of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, a really crack uh, a lawyer in terms of First Amendment issues. And Jane and I worked with this group and basically out of it, we were able to, to identify a set of ethics that were that were real, in a sense, as opposed to uh, the Ten Commandments that uh, no, no one can remember. Uh, another question that I've been asked to address is, how do we measure? How do we measure success or failure? And uh, some of this is whimsy and some of it is real. Uh, I think the important thing is that we really need to know what is the skills level of the people we're working with at the start so that we have some kind of a benchmark and some kind of way of measuring what happens to them in whether it's a workshop or a, a one-year fellowship or whether it's a two-week visit to the U.S. Uh, we need to know where they're at, what their expectations are, and then we have to start moving through uh, some analysis of what is happening. I'm, I'm, I was really concerned about uh, Stefan's experiences in terms of talking about people who felt their time was wasted in, in Romania by trainers. Uh, that tells me something. One thing is that tells me is that there probably was no kind of, of careful evaluation either before or during or after the, after the, the, uh, the, the program itself. So I, I, one of the things that, I, that, we, that we emphasize, uh, because we come out of universities where, where uh, uh, Detailed uh, teacher evaluations are really, really important. Uh, you need to build into this, into whatever the training program is, a really good, careful evaluation process. Something that measures things in, in, along the way, and then also at the end, what was the outcome. Now, I get uh, an, another part of this, I was asked to, to think about how do we talk about the long range impact of what we're doing? And that reminds me of sort of, you know, I, I, when I was chair of the department at, of journalism at, at the university, I was always afraid that some crazed parent was going to come in my office and say, I've spent $20,000 this year on my kid, and what has he learned, or what has she learned, uh, and you better tell me. And if you don't tell me, you're in trouble. Uh, in a way, that, that's a legitimate question, but uh, what we have to do is remember that, that learning and motivation and all the other things we're talking about happens in uh, different kinds of ways. That sometimes it's one idea that you planted that a year later, a couple of years later, somebody comes back and says, hey, you know, I, placed, I, put, I have a new career because of that particular experience. So what I'm talking about is the idea that when we're doing this training, we're not just dealing with a group of, of anonymous people in front of us. We have to encourage them to really talk to us about the context in which they're working and help them in terms of uh, problems that they're having. <coughs> I'm thinking of uh, there's hardly a, a, a program that I do where I don't have somebody in there who has a really serious issue about survival. Um, and, and it relates to the it relates to them in terms of uh, of their work as journalists. Uh, a good example, I had a, a journalist I worked with in investigative reporting by the name of Jacob Capagna, who was in uh, Banja Luka. And uh, I was going to, after having met him and were doing the workshop with him, I was going to meet him in Banja Luka, and two days before we were going to meet, uh, someone rigged his car and blew it up, and he lost both of his legs. I spent the next couple of months dealing with Jacob in terms of 
he's getting prosthetics and getting help for what, what he needed. Uh, we had another program in, in Washington not too long ago where the, uh, where the journalists, uh, we had a group of Iraqi journalists, and one of them, uh, this, this, the, uh, his son happened to mention that his father was in Washington, and, and by the time this got into the, into the grapevine, uh, that particular journalist could not go back to Iraq. With, uh, without being unsafe. Uh, you just mentioned, and I like some kind of definition, Sure. Uh, the training is necessary <coughs> for long-range or long-term results. What do you mean by long-term or long-range, particularly in an era where internet years where it's okay. you know, seven dog years or whatever? Okay. Uh, a long-term for me at a minimum would be one, one year to two to three years. I think that we, we you know, we, what we need to do is, is is to build continuity into our relationship with the, with wherever we're doing the training, and come back six months later, come back a year later, or in some way have some kind of feedback mechanism through the internet so you can talk to the people that you worked with, and then you know ask them flat out, uh, you know, give me some examples of stories that you've done because of this or things that you're doing better, uh, or or again if 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 we can't find this, uh, how do we how do we make a change? Uh, does that answer? Okay. Uh, so you know, for me, I think it's important to talk about building an indigenous staff wherever we're de developing a program, and have an exit strategy. Uh, I think it's really important that we anchor the program. A lot of the, a lot of really good effort goes into programs in in the various continents. Uh, where people do a lot of work and then they disappear and then there, there's no program anymore. And uh, so we look for things like universities, for uh, reputable associations of journalists, whatever it happens to be, NGOs, someplace where we can find a, 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 a linkage. The other important thing I think is really to build into your concept the idea of training trainers. Again, if you want to give any kind of, kind of continuity to what you're doing, beyond a week or beyond a couple of weeks, you've got to start building a whole coterie of, of staff who can go back to their own print and broadcast people. Uh, in all of this, I would, I, and I'm hoping in the, in the conversation that we have, we really emphasize the need to do this within the context of what is happening with uh, new media. I mean, there is so much that we may in fact be able to transfer to a new media environment. Uh, not everybody gets to be in a program, uh, probably 1% of the people, and, and very often that 1% may not include the best people. And there's got to be a way of, of developing uh, that, that kind of long-range long -range contact. The other thing that I think is important is that with the, we have to look at the impact on, this, on the unit that is, that is supporting. If a university, Harvard, Rutgers, Columbia, whatever, whoever it happens to be, if they are putting energies into this kind of thing, they need to know uh, what kind of payoff is, in there, is there for them. I'm not, I'm not talking about a financial payoff, but the idea that this interaction with another culture, with another country, with another continent is really important and really important to their students and to their faculty in terms of enriching what is there. Uh, I have a couple of suggestions that uh, I, I, I'm going to close off with. Uh, one of them is, uh, I think we really need a central data bank. We need some place uh, where we can go and, and get some good feedback on what programs are, number one, just what programs are existing, and what are they doing, and how well are they doing it, and what is going well with them, and what is going wrong with them, and what kinds of techniques can we start to share. Uh, I know that the, there's the, the Center for Media Assistance that are trying to do, do something like this, and these are good beginnings, but I, don't still, I still don't see out there a data bank that I can go to to, uh, to identify this. Uh, in terms of how to measure this, I think uh, content analysis will do it. Uh, I mean, I would go back and, and revisit those papers and radio and TV stations and get a sense of what kind of reporting they did after the training and after the special support that they got. Uh, it's got to show up somewhere. Uh, it has to show up in terms of public understanding, public policy, whatever that happens to be. Uh, 
I think you know we've got a marvelous tool with the internet now in terms of citizen feedback, uh, and I think that there's a way of, of starting to think about these programs so that uh, we are we are getting feedback from people, from the journalists, from the uh, from their audience, whether it's readers or or whatever, or viewers or listeners or whatever they happen to be. Uh, uh, finally, there are a couple of things that uh, you know Peter and I have uh, actually. This has been a wonderful. Uh, stimulus for Peter and I to be thinking about where we want to go with some of our own work and we're, and we're starting to think in very specifically about some things that we might, might want to do in the Middle East and that we've, uh, that where we need to go back and reflect on what's happened in, in Eastern and Central Europe. Uh, what lessons were learned from that? Uh, and there are lessons that we, can, that we can, can pull from this. At the same time, we have to warn ourselves that the Middle East is not the former Yugoslavia, and it's not, it is not any of that region. It is, it is, uh, there are fundamentals of journal, <coughs> excuse me, there are fundamentals of journalism that cross all countries and all, and throughout the globe, but there are very sensitive kinds of cultural and, and valued kinds of religion, culture, et cetera, et cetera, and we can, can't make the mistake of saying, okay, let's take this, take this little plant and try to replant it in, in another environment. Uh, one last thing that I would just like to uh, talk about, and that is, uh, I, I have a colleague, uh, Dick Hefner, who is uh, the moderator of a PBS program called The Open Mind, and he, uh, he we had an interview discussion uh, recent, not recently, but within the last year. And one of the things I was asking uh, that people think about, and I would like to raise it here as well, Back in the 1930s, when we had a really serious depression, we had something called the uh, CCC, the Civilian Cons Conservation Corps. We had a lot of people out of work. We had a lot of people looking around to try to find careers. What are they going to do? In some ways, it, uh, it represents what is happening in the media now. I mean, the whole media landscape has been turned upside down. Uh, and, and at the same time, we have a whole new group of people coming in, citizen journalists who want to play in this, in this new arena. And what I'd like to do is, is close off by suggesting that we think about some kind of a civilian communication corps. The idea that we have a lot of faculty, uh, retired and, and not retired. We have a lot of journalists and former journalists, some who left journalism not of their will but because of a payout or buyout or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of talent out there. And if there's some way that we could start looking at everything that we're talking about, and, and create a, a, a context for, for, for training and for uh, conversation, if nothing else. Uh, I, uh, when Carol uh, asked me to think about this, I came up with six pages of bullets, but I'm not going to shoot them all at you now, and I deliberately didn't use PowerPoint because that would have been fatal. Uh, but thank you, and I hope we can talk. Good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you for doing this sort of a conference and finally bringing East Central Europe back into focus, because nowadays it's very hard to, uh, to compete against all the, uh, the interests in the Middle East, and I still think that Eastern Europe is one of the very important uh, regions in the world that we do need to concentrate on continuously. As Jerry has suggested, we have, uh, we have been doing this sort of training for, um, well, 20 years now. Uh, most of us in this small group uh, that uh, started this in 1990 had interests in Eastern Europe before. That is, we studied um, from a scholarly perspective what was going on there, or we were journalists that uh, were assigned to Eastern Europe. Um, or some other tie to the region. So we came to this uh, not with any ba not with uh, without a background uh, and some knowledge in the in the history and the politics and the economic uh, situation and the cultures uh, of uh, those countries in that region. And as Jerry has described the uh, the process, really, we were first asked to do assessment studies in various countries. Um, uh, mostly on behalf of the United States Information Agency, which is now defunct, unfortunately. 
um, as well as the Freedom Forum and some other organizations that were getting involved in that part of the, uh, part of the world. And uh, so I was asked to sort of summarize what kind of aid uh, and training we were asked to do. And um, we were really asked to help out in six different areas, if you will. Uh, and I'll list them, and then I want to talk about each one of them and see where we've had some success and where we've had some failures. And I think those things might suggest what we might do from now on and might also suggest what kind of an approach we might take, let's say, in the Middle East or elsewhere. Uh, first of all, we, we, uh, the goals were to um, establish independent media. Secondly, uh, we were to bring the Eastern European media technologically up to snuff with, uh, with uh, what was available at that time um, uh, in, in the world. Thirdly, um, we were to ideationally and conceptually tie it uh, to Western values uh, related to freedom of the press and all of those other good things that we talked about uh, um, in the process of democratization of these countries. Third, uh, we were tasked with helping them to articulate the appropriate laws and rules and regulations and, and ethical codes uh, that were applicable to this new media world that they, uh, they had after 1989 as they were democratizing. Fourth, um, we were to bring their journalism up to some professional standards uh, that were consonant with this new role that they had in uh, democratization and democracy. And um, last but not least, we were going to, we were tasked with helping um, what was their national broadcasting systems make the, uh, the transition to being true public service um, uh, uh, broadcasting uh, units. Um, I think the problem that we all shared at the time that is that we were not quite clear um, as to what our expectations uh, uh, were going to be. Uh, we all bought into the notion, of course, that we were helping these countries democratize, and in our case, doing it by way of improving their media in a number of different ways. But it was unclear what those expectations were, partly because what we were tasked to do uh, was rather separate from the other um, uh, projects that were going on in Eastern Europe to help them democratize. I mean, we talked today about civil society. We talked today about all sorts of other issues that are part and parcel of a discussion about establishing a new media. Uh, we didn't really do that. We were sort of doing this stuff um, in, in somewhat of a vacuum, and I think that was a very big mistake. Uh, that. I think we need to pay attention to when it comes to other regions of the world that we might get involved in, 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 in uh, trying to help their media evolve uh, to another level. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that uh, uh, the United States was really first into Eastern Europe after the events of 1989, ahead of the Europeans, uh, I think, uh, from what I have seen. Uh, and I think one of the things that, uh, one of the mistakes that we have made is not coordinating our training programs and our aid with the West Europeans from the very beginning. But we can talk about that because that's a, that's, that's a sort of a separate issue. So let me revisit the, the points that I mentioned that we were tasked with, uh, with doing and see if we succeeded or not. Um, first, establishing independent media. Uh, this was somewhat problematic because in most countries, um, the minute the communist regimes disappeared, all of the media labeled themselves independent. Uh, and indeed they were for a number of days or weeks until the political, the newly formed or reformed political parties 
uh, decided that it was very important for them to own one of those media enterprises in order to further their political aspirations and, and compete uh, for power uh, in this new world of, quote, democracy, uh, in which many of them, by the way, interpret it as, as simply meaning that it, it should be my turn to be in power and dictate. That softened as the last 20 years evolved, of course, but that was the major approach to it. So truly independent media was really difficult to establish. Some of the underground press that existed, for example, in Poland and Hungary and the old Czechoslovakia, uh, truly did establish themselves as independent media. Gazeta Wyborcza was, was, uh, was mentioned here, and I believe somebody in the back earlier today mentioned Nepšabacak in Hungary. Um, but, but that was a difficult task anyway. Over the last 20 years, we can say that some independent media outlets were indeed established, very, very few in that region, in each country. And these independent uh, media enterprises um, are, are somewhat problematic, and they're problematic precisely because there are so few of them given that the rest of the media are either government controlled or controlled by politicians or owners that have a stake in a political party uh, or are buddy-buddy with another politician and therefore are on their side. So the independent media that does exist in Eastern Europe is, it has, has a rather difficult task because being so few in number, they become almost a counterpower to all of the other media that are not independent and therefore take on a political role that in and of itself makes them less than independent. Second, the, the uh, issue of bringing these media uh, technologically into the 20th century at that time. This was really the easiest task and I think the most successful task that we performed. That is, we brought in equipment or got grants over there that would purchase equipment, uh, printing equipment, broadcast equipment, uh, 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 all sorts of equipment that uh, allowed for the dissemination of, of media in one form or another. We were very successful in that. Third, uh, bringing uh, the, the ide ideational and conceptual um, uh, issues uh, to the forefront in such a way that would tie these uh, East, East Central European media uh, to Western values related to freedom of the press, this was a much more difficult task. Here is where we ran into historical and cultural issues that in many cases were insurmountable, particularly in the short term. In the long term, of course, these issues um, were not resolved, but are slowly moving to some sort of a resolution but they have to be accomplished from the inside of these countries and not from the outside. We could not go in there and say, okay, now you have democracy. Uh, act this way. Act according to these values. That just doesn't work. And indeed, it has not worked in East Central Europe. And because of that, some of the other elements of improving media, of bringing aid to media, of, in, of, of bringing uh, training to the media didn't, uh, didn't work very well. Culture is slow to change. Okay. And the other thing that we forgot, of course, is that we dealt with East Central Europe essentially as a monolithic post-communist world, forgetting often that each one of these countries is quite different from a historical and cultural perspective, and therefore the approach to, their train, to, to train them and the approach to what we expected of them should have been different. But we didn't. We always talked about we're aiding, we're training post-communist uh, media, post-communist journalists. Okay. By the way, I, in, in, in the interest of, of uh, honesty, I was born in East Central Europe. Okay. So I'm from that region. Um, I speak some of the languages, and 
I was always a bit more sensitive to the issues of, of culture uh, when it came to any sort of training program and to those things that might have suggested in the context of aiding um, East Central Europe. Um, next, we were tasked, as I said, with helping them to articulate um, more democratic, uh, democratically appropriate laws and regulations and ethics. And I would, in, in my estimation, we were successful in doing that. If you read the laws pertaining to media in all of the countries of East Central Europe or the regulations or even the ethics, they sound very much like anything you might find over here in another, in another well-established Western democracy. The difference, however, is how these laws and regulations and, law and, and uh, ethics are applied. And this gets back to that basic notion that you can establish new institutions, that you can have a systemic and institutional change in a particular country, but the problem is not the changeover from the old institutions to the new institutions or from the old system to the new system, but rather making the new system and the new institutions act differently, function differently. And what we've seen in Eastern Europe since 1989 is that, yes, we have new institutions, and they all look very Western. Yes, we have a new system, and it looks very Western but it functions according to those specific cultures and the accumulated history and the historical approaches to institutions that, that each one of these countries uh, in, in specific uh, has. So this is the difficulty in effecting a transition or a transformation, not establishing a new system or a new institution, but making, it, making them work differently than they did before. And if you think back in history, in the aftermath of the 1848 revolutions in Europe, young Poles and young Romanians came back to Warsaw or to Bucharest with the intent of changing the system, of changing the institutions, and they managed that very well. What they found out after a couple of decades is that they still function the way the old institutions did, except that they were newly formulated according to a Western formula. Okay. So we were not very successful. Um, defamation laws, uh, the infamous defamation laws in Eastern Europe were almost all of them placed in the criminal code rather than the civil code. And of course, the Eastern Europeans pointed to the Western Europeans and said, well, many of you have defamation codes, uh, defamation laws in your criminal codes as well. So why should we be different? <coughs> we too are exactly the way you are. I'd like to interrupt you there and talk about defamation just briefly. Um, in Western law, defamation Truth is an absolute defense to defamation. Is that the same case in uh, Central and Eastern Europe? No. Okay, well there's a big difference then. Well, uh, yeah, but here again, it's, it's, it's a cultural matter. Right. And you mentioned also that uh, culture takes a long time to change. Right. So when you're trying to implement new values, Western values, democratic values, what is the incubation period, or what should we expect in terms of years, for example? Yeah. Well, uh, I, you know, uh, who was it that said, I think, I think it was Casey Stengel who said, I won't make any predictions, especially not about the future. So I will, I will instead quote somebody, um, uh, the, the late uh, Derendorf, uh, who, who is one of my favorite uh, um, social scientist, if you will, um, who's, a, who's a German who immigrated to Britain and, and made a name for himself there. He said 60 years. Now, whether he's right or wrong, I have no idea. 
we had this, uh, this hullabaloo in Romania in the early 1990s when Silvio Brucan, who was a former Communist uh, Party member, high Communist Party member, who in the latter years of, of his life uh, turned into, I won't say a dissident, but, but he objected to what the Ceausescu regime was doing. And uh, we had this discussion in the, in the early 1990s when he suggested that it's going to take Romania 20 years to make the transition or to transform itself from, from a communist country to a democratic country. Okay. Well, they, they just about lynched him at that time because uh, the Romanians said, well, you know, we're not that stupid. Uh, you're insulting us. We don't need 20 years. I had a meeting with, uh, with Mr. Brucan uh, in Constanza in the mid-1990s, and I said, look, um, it's going to take you many more decades than 20 years. So it was his turn to get mad at me, saying, well, we're not that stupid. I said, well, you're repeating the same thing that, that uh, the press said at the time. I don't know how many years it, it can take. Um, but, but the question itself presupposes that all of these different cultures will make a switch over to your culture or my culture and therefore arrive at that exalted level where they're the same as us. That will never happen. These are different cultures. They will stay different. They will evolve. They will get better or worse. But I think the presumption on our side that we're going to talk about a transition or a transformation, no matter how many years it takes, that has to be assessed, its success has to be assessed in terms of being like us, is simply wrong. Well, I'm not suggesting that, we're, that they may be like us in 20 years or six years. And the gentleman may be right in that uh, uh, it would take far less time in terms of new technology has sort of increased or accelerated the pace of change. And that even institutions here, Western values and other institutions, are changing as a consequence of the new technology. So it won't necessarily be American culture or Western culture. It may be the culture of the digital age or the Internet culture. Right. And I have no disagreement with that, but we're talking about democracy. And the question is, does, does this new technology, uh, will this new technology help countries democratize or do the opposite? Would it, would, would it, will it help us be a, a more democratic country or a less democratic country? We're entering the unknown. We know that new technologies are present. We know that they're going to stay. We know that they're affecting everything, most certainly media and journalism. But what the result will be of this changeover to this new, these new technologies is unknown. We don't know. We need at least another decade in this country to figure out how it's going to affect journalism and the media as a whole, as an institution. Um, we, we have even more time uh, to, to, to sit and study uh, the issue in, in, uh, in societies that come from something other than a democratic background, whether it's Eastern Europe or Latin America after the dictatorships of the, uh, disappeared there in the mid-1980s. Um, uh, they, they're not democracies. Okay? And, and many more years have passed since uh, the mid-1980s. And now in the Middle East, uh, with their cultures, um, uh, certainly not being um, um, anything even close to, uh, to what you might find in Eastern Europe, who knows how long it will take for them to democratize. Indeed, why do we assume that they will democratize? Just because they were out in the streets uh, protesting uh, a particular king or dictator or whatever the case may be. But uh, please allow me to re-engage uh, because I have two more points. Um, we were also tasked with bringing uh, <coughs> journalism uh, to, to a professional level that, that was consonant with a democracy. And, and here is where we engaged in training, of course. Um, 
And here is where I think our greatest failure has been. We expected immediate results. We didn't get them. Um, we also expected a cumulative result. And I think in, in this instance, we can say, well, we did put certain techniques on the table. We did talk about certain values that may have been absorbed uh, by osmosis or whatever other form by East uh, Central European journalists, and indeed they have gotten better. The fact that they can't practice what they have learned is due to what Stefan has described, because the situation in Romania, as he described it, is not just in Romania. It's in all the other countries, and in some cases it's getting worse in some countries. Hungary is one example, uh, and of course Hungary was one of those uh, uh, countries that was destined for quick success because of its background and because it, was, it, it had a communism that was not quite as harsh as what you found in Albania or Romania or Bulgaria. And now we see the opposite happening. Our training, I think, was very good and continues to be very good. The problem is that these young uh, um, journalists learn what they learn. They go back to the editorial rooms, and they're not allowed to practice <coughs> that sort of journalism anyway. And you know, just as an aside, again, investigative journalism was mentioned over here. There is some very good investigative journalism going on in East Central Europe. And it's not all only by independent <coughs> investigative journalists. It's all also being done ironically for political reasons. So let's say I own a newspaper or a radio or a TV station, and you own one. But we're on opposite sides politically. I will get one of my journalists to do a very good <coughs> investigative report on something that interests you or something that touches one of your family or one of your friends or one of your political colleagues or whatever the case may be. So there is good, journal, uh, there is good investigative journalism done, ironically, for the wrong reasons. It's, it's a get you sort of thing. But there is that. Okay? The other thing that helped in the early 1990s in this training of journalists is the very fact that they looked at the United States and they liked what they saw of American journalism. The example of American journalism was great. The example of how they perceived Americans to think about their own media and their own journalism was of help. I dare say that is no longer the case. I won't get into that since that's not the subject of, of this meeting. Uh, the way the U.S. government acted or reacted vis-a-vis -vis anything negative that might uh, occur uh, uh, on the part with, with one of the media outlets here or with one of the journalists. They like to see that the U.S. government indeed practiced freedom of the press by allowing uh, anything and anything and, and everything to be published without punishing a media outlet or a journalist. That too is no longer the case. And I want to bring a, up an example that occurred about two weeks ago which really angered me. Uh, this is an example from Tirana, Albania. There was an opinion piece that was published in one of the Albanian newspapers middle of, of April. I think it was April 11th. The opinion piece was about the American ambassador in Tirana. It was perceived by the American embassy to not only be negative, but be racist. Because as I understand it, the American ambassador in Albania is of Asian descent. And the writer talked about a very small person representing a very big country, and so forth and so on. It is irrelevant whether it was racist or not. The American embassy, the public affairs uh, reporter, the, the public affairs uh, officer, sent a letter to this newspaper saying that this newspaper henceforth will be banned from the American embassy 
the American Embassy will no longer send any press releases to this newspaper, nor have any relationship with this newspaper or its reporters. The worst possible example. To continue, we were not very successful um, on the whole, and are less so today, I think, in training, even though we do a very good job. I'm talking about the outcome, not what we do, or how we do it even. But we're not very successful in, in having journalists in Eastern Europe practice a different kind of journalist, journalism that they practice now. Last point, the, the help that we were supposed to extend to um, public service broadcasting. Public service broadcasting in, in Eastern Europe, well, let, let me step back for a second. What we found in 1989 or 1990 when we stepped into Eastern Europe on the technical side, it was, it was the, uh, uh, the media version of Jurassic Park. Um, public television there, that is the television that was essentially controlled by the communist government, that then became so-called public service television and radio, almost instantly was grabbed by the party that came to power and served as its mouthpiece and continues to do so today. The notion of public service simply doesn't exist in East Central Europe. So we were utterly unsuccessful in trying to persuade them that a public service broadcasting institution truly should be public service. Now they all admire the BBC but that's different. So we were not very su uh, successful in, in, in changing their mentalities when it came to, to uh, public service, what should be public service um, broadcasting. So last but not least, I was asked for some suggestions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some suggestions. And by the way, I, that, that report by Helen Hume for the um, uh, Center for International Media Assistance, excellent, uh, because it gets to the point of what we need, I think. Um, here is my two cents worth. Um, first, we need media literacy programs. Um, and I don't just mean at the high school level or college level. I think one of the things that we miss doing in the early years is also training politicians, business people, students, teachers, uh, professors, uh, people from all walks of life to understand why media or free media uh, are important in a democracy. Uh, we miss that opportunity. We can still re-engage in this project by reaching uh, high school students and college students. And actually, Romania has got a, an incipient program in that respect, which is not all that bad. I kind of like it. Um, we need media democracy, tra uh, media and democracy tra uh, training, media and law kind of training, again, at all levels of society. Uh, we need to train the audience, too, uh, to expect something different from the media than what they're getting. Uh, they will instinctively reject things, um, things that are inaccurate things that, that don't seem to jive with their experiences and with their daily lives. But they still need to, to get some sort of sense as to what they should look for in the media and in journalism in a dem uh, democratic society. Journalists in Eastern Europe have for 20 years, to this, to this very day, they continue using the excuse for continuing their practice of journalism the way they've done it for so long by saying, well, you know, the, the audience doesn't want fact-based journalism. They, they don't understand that. We need to explain things to them. Uh, we know where that leads, okay, where that leads to. So I think the, the, the audience writ large needs some training in understanding 
why media are important in democracy and what to expect from journalism. Uh, we need to find ways to coordinate our aid and training with the West Europeans. They do have other uh, goals than we do, in part, in part. They may share the notion that we need to uh, um, train Eastern Europeans to understand why media is important in democracy and how to do good journalism, but they also have some very specific goals that have to do with uh, uh, EU integration, which is a nebulous kind of thing, and again, a different topic for a different, uh, different seminar or a different conference. Um, but we, we do need to um, um, coordinate some things with them. More aid to university journalism-based programs. Um, I think that needs to be done for a number of reasons. First of all, when I say aid to journalism programs, I mean to faculty first. They need to train better faculty. Many of the faculty members that you find in journalism, university-based journalism programs in Eastern Europe to this very day, even though it's 20 years after, after communism is gone, uh, are people who practice journalism under the communists. Um, you still find people who will do a lot of theory and no practice. So you need to engage with university-based journalism programs, in my view, to, to train faculty members both as journalism teachers but also as mass media researchers. And that process has started, by the way, and there are some very good scholars that are cropping up in Eastern Europe, but again, there are far few in numbers to make a, a great deal of, uh, of uh, difference at this point. Um, we need to lead by example, and I'm not quite sure how to do that at the point where American journalism um, is learning more from East European journalism than East European journalism is learning from American journalism, it seems. Uh, and it's also very hard to set a good example when what happened just recently with the uh, uh, Albanian case that I've, I've related uh, keeps happening. And last but not least, I think we need to define our expectations much more clearly and much more succinctly than we have. And those expectations should be lower. A step-by-step -step approach to outlining expectations, uh, short-term, long-term, and all of these have to be married to whatever other pro aid projects and training projects we have in a society that is in transition, and that is at the economic level, civil society, uh, and so forth and so on. All of that has to mesh. It has to be a, a total commitment and a total approach to training and aid rather than just saying, well, we do media aid and training over here, and you guys do everything else over there. That won't work. Thank you. Uh, before we open it up to uh, questions directly from the audience, um, I would like to have uh, both of our speakers at least make a comment uh, in regard to what they think the representative from USAID may have said, particularly in regards to whether or not the, uh, it was a mistake to eliminate the uh, United States Information Agency, uh, whether or not the uh, uh, USAID should uh, be funding uh, media literacy programs uh, throughout the world, whether they uh, have the resources to do so, or uh, whether they uh, even think it may be important, uh, and whether or not uh, they are currently playing a uh, an effective role in providing assistance uh, to meet today's and tomorrow's needs. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I guess I would answer the question by going back to my earlier suggestion that 
we have to go in and do a fair, fairly intensive study of what the people feel they need. And uh, I, can, I, I, don't, I don't see USAID being the funding source for something like this. I do see one of the foundations, Ford, uh, Soros, someone else being receptive to this. Uh, I think it's going to be a hard sell on the, on the, on the media literacy. Uh, unless it's built in with a, with a, if it's built into the batter with a lot of other, uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, uh, training focused kinds of things. I think that uh, AID is not, I, I'd be surprised if AID went for that. I agree. I mean, AID has done a lot of stuff, but, mm -hmm. but uh, um, they're changing directions all the time. And now that they're focused on the Middle East, I'm not quite sure what they have in mind. I haven't read anything uh, specifically that would uh, teach me anything as to what they want to do. I think they're fishing at this point. And I, and I wish Sarah would be here to explain it because I want to, I want to hear about it. We had, we had um, a recent experience in the Middle East that was very much akin to what we found in Eastern Europe, in fact. Um, we had a big grant from IREX to help um, journalism programs in Jordan uh, and also establish some, some quote, independent media. And uh, the situation was almost identical to what we found in Eastern Europe in that we, mm -hmm. when I say we, I'm, I'm talking about a grant that was given to my school, so our faculty went over and did this. Um, we installed equipment, broadcasting equipment, among other things. Uh, did some training, and uh, my, my faculty colleagues came back, and they all said the same thing. They were very thankful for this new equipment. They understood what we said in, in, in regard to what, what they should do in, in their journalism. Uh, and then when all was said and done, as we were leaving, they said, well, of course, you know, we can't do any of these things that, that you said we ought to do. Uh, again, signaling that, that the approach to this problem has to be um, through other audiences rather than a group of journalism students or, or journalists and editors. Yeah. Society as a whole needs to be educated in, in what you want to do with this new journalism. Okay, questions? Bob. Um, Peter, oh, you mentioned that some of the reporters that you train go back to their news organizations and are not allowed to do the kind of journalism they're being trained for. Do you attempt to reach the editors and the higher executives who disallow this kind of journalism to try to educate them in seeing the possibilities in a different way? Not formally, because we didn't have that task. Informally, of course, I've gotten to, to know many editors across the region and talk to them often. And their explanation is always the same. We can't do that. We can't do that because of the audiences, and we can't do that because the owners don't want that done. Um, journalism in East Central Europe, all across East Central Europe, including with the independent press, as I tried to suggest, is very, very political. Everything there is political. And everything works on the basis of political contacts, families. Um, often uh, journalistic enterprises are um, less important for their economic uh, um, uh, possibilities than, than for the political exigencies that, that um, the owners perceive. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a fight all the time. And some good journalism is practiced, and, and often it's practiced uh, uh, despite this uh, politicized media world, because it's convenient to one outlet or another to do some good reporting if it's a matter of getting the other guy. How long will it take to evolve a new thinking about it? No, you're, you're asking me to predict again. <laughs> well, as you said 50 years. The future, years, too. 50 years, too. Yeah. Uh, um, is that part of the 50-year equation? Yeah. 
I, I think it's going to take decades. And, and I want to stress that no matter how much help they get from the outside and how much help we ought to give them, uh, I think we must have the expectation that they have to change themselves. Because if they don't change themselves, it's not really going to happen. You know, I think the issue, though, is what, how do you bring about change? It's not just sand coming down through the hourglass. You know, it, it, there, are, there are strategies that will deal with that editor who is afraid to uh, do the piece. Uh, I, was in, I was in Romania two weeks ago to, to do some programs, and I, I heard over and over again, we've actually produced these things, and we've even printed them in some cases, or, or broadcast them, or put them on, on the internet. Uh, and yet we're not getting the kind of response that we want. And at the same time, uh, there are a set of things that we can do. Basic, I think you know, if we were going to ask AID or whoever the funder is to think about this, to open up those channels that are clogged up now, I think that I, ca I heard over and over again from the journalists that I worked with, and again in, in previous workshops, uh, the fact that we feel so alone, we feel so isolated, uh, we feel endangered in many cases, that we're going to die if we do this. And I think that there are things that we, that we might be able to go to a funder to say, look, Nolan raised the point uh, earlier in our discussions when we, were, when we were talking about the panel of the idea of insurance. And I started thinking about that a little bit more. And in fact, there are many journalists who would feel a lot more comfortable if they knew that there was the equivalent of a Reporters Committee of Freedom of the Press with attorneys back, backing them up. If, if in fact they were going to do libel or slander, slanderous potential kinds of stories, uh, they at least know that there's a pool of money somewhere or there are a, a pool of lawyers who would be willing to back them up. The other thing that I found in, in, in the recent discussions was the fact that when they say we feel so alone, uh, the idea of, of the kinds of stuff that, that Stefan is doing I think is really important in terms of that investigative center where you're doing cross-border uh, uh, integration and, and then action action with other other units. I th it would be really good if we could establish our program so that there is solidarity in the sense that uh, a committee to protect journalists will really step in and will do it now for a journalist who's endangered. Uh, a lot of the journalists I've talked with and worked with who have gotten in trouble needed help not only for themselves but for their families. And we need some kind of insurance pool that basically protects maybe a life insurance for the, for the, for the journalist. Perhaps there's a, uh, a, a libel slander kind of protection insurance. But also we need some kind of a pool of money to support the families. I mean, there was one really heroic case involving, uh, we were working in Serbia and uh, a journalist there suddenly had his radio station taken away from him. He couldn't go back. He ended up coming here as uh, I think uh, th through through your good graces, uh, we, he was able to establish himself here and get his family out. Uh, these kinds of these are very practical kinds of things that the journalists need uh, right now. Uh, I'll stop there. Yeah. My name is Kathy Kanter, and uh, by professional background, I'm a journalist, and now I'm a student, mid-career student of Master of Public Administration at the Harry Kennedy School. I just wanted to, to share with you an, an illustration of the practice that we had with public service broadcasting that you, Professor Gross, mentioned. It's just, it was just about what you were mentioning. Um, we journalists at the Moldovan public service broadcasting, we um, initiated a national and international campaign against uh, censorship at the Moldovan uh, public uh, television. And uh, of course, uh, I, um, it is a half success, half failure story. The success story is that the European Court of Human Rights, after a couple of years, after we've uh, lodged a complaint against uh, the government, they, uh, they put in their case law the fact that this is a gross violation of human rights. So it was a political step because they um, explicitly, explicitly stated in their case law that uh, governments are not, uh, cannot interfere in editorial policy of a television. Uh, but what I wanted to say is exactly about the society um, readiness to accept and to value freedom of expression. When we uh, started this national and international campaign, uh, we were doing like things that we were a little bit scared of, like we had statements uh, um, 
of uh, um, stating that journalists are against the freedom of expression, against uh, censorship. And uh, one day a uh, viewer called us and said, what you weird things we do when we are in poverty. And when after one year, after one, one year the authorities did give up and we adopted the law on public survey broadcasting, mm -hmm. they did it, they adopted the law, but when they needed to implement the law, they simply, simply didn't re-employ the most courageous journalists. And it was a shock for the entire society. I was in the UK. Uh, at that time, but my colleagues were not re-employed. So it was a lesson and a shock for the entire society. No one stepped up. Absolutely no one. So when we had this, there were the parallel uh, protests uh, in the square and they came to, to support us. So it was a wave of democracy. But when after one year the momentum was lost, it was like no one stepped in, no international organizations, no media, no one. So I think these cultures in Eastern Europe, they, they have this, um, it's just the first stage of development when they are like this, when they are on the barricades. But when it comes to this day-to-day -day democracy building, they are lost. So no one is there to support journalists. And it was a lesson, just don't do these things. So when people don't know what freedom of expression is for, it's very difficult to, to talk of it. Welcome back, Pete. Gentlemen in the back. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, uh, I talked to a, a couple of the people from the previous panel, and uh, I, I suggested that the word uh, condition of impunity seems to be the case in much of Eastern Europe in terms of uh, uh, the environment of uh, uh, challenging journalism. Uh, and uh, I, I had a, one point was that uh, it may be the case that the situation is so bad that, that what's needed is not journalistic reform, but uh, uh, an international legal enforcement approach. Uh, uh, there were a couple of programs at, over uh, over in the CGIS South uh, the last couple of three weeks. Uh, there, a fellow named Carlos Castrasana uh, was part of an international uh, impunity commission uh, directed at Guatemala, and and uh, uh, he had a, a tremendous success using uh, 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 lawyers and and wiretaps and gun uh, that is uh, police with guns. Uh, and, and it involved arresting, you know, Supreme Court justices and, and people like that. Uh, and, and the people that I, I talked to here uh, 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 suggested that, in fact, the governments in, in, in Eastern Europe and Russia are not interested in changing the, the, the atmosphere of impunity. That such that, I mean, the reason why these stories aren't going through is because the, the editors, I surmise, would uh, uh, fear for the lives of the reporters. Uh, uh, so uh, that's, that I had a, a one other point if there's time, if, if, with your permission. Yes. The moderator. You're the moderator, no one. Uh, let's hear from others. I'll come okay. back can, to I, can I say something about Go that? Ahead, yeah. um, first of all, the, the situation in Russia is different from the, from the situation in East Central Europe, in any of those countries. Okay? Uh, control or attempted control of journalists and journalism in Russia comes from the government side. In the rest of Eastern Europe, it comes from different political parties, politicians, and the government. So it's a different situation altogether. I'm, I'm always reluctant to, to involve more laws and regulations, particularly when it comes to journalists, though, because that has a snowball effect sooner or later. So I, I would not like what you have You, you don't agree the prosecution of the, uh, the perpetrators of these, these, uh, these uh, assassinations? Or oh, sure. I, I, uh, that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the rooting out of the, that, that, that's what I was suggesting. No, I, I thought you wanted some laws and regulations. Oh, well, the they, only law I was suggesting was that, that, that the, I mean, that the defamation, truth should continue to be, or uh, should become a, 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 a defense against the defamation. Well, certainly. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my name's Tom Simons. I was a U.S. ambassador to Poland from 90 to 93 when, some of this was going on. I'd also served in Romania, so I, I knew Brukhan before he became Brukhan. Uh, I'm disturbed to hear so much blame for the constraints and the, the tragic situation blamed on the culture rather than on the economic structures. Because it seems to me that a lot of the things constraining free journalism are the fact that the state is very heavy in the economy as in Russia, or oligarchs. I mean, you, you do not have a market for free journalism 
mm -hmm. uh, out there, and so you get state-dominated journalism or oligarch-dominated journalism, and it's it's going to be gunslinger journalism in either case. And until you can change something like that, like that, you know, all the training programs of sensitivity training for what journalism should do mm -hmm. are uh, going to be running into the sand. And I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more from both of you yeah, I, on the, uh, the problem is Murdoch. I mean, we're not a very good example given Murdoch's role mm -hmm. in our uh, journalism, but the, the problem is, is Murdoch or state control of the economy, which prevents Mm -hmm. Free journalism from from developing a market for itself. It seems. Yeah, I think that that's why the um, we've been talking about training and focusing just on reporters and and editors, and, and we 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 should really be talking about programs that reach out to all facets of say of a newspaper in terms of uh, business management, uh, technology, uh, uh, advertising strategies, new 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 economic models. I mean. We're, we're sort of in a, uh, the American media has, has, has been the, uh, the victim of uh, an earthquake in terms of new technology hit, followed by the tsunami of uh, bad economics, and then on top of that, the meltdown that we have. And, 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 but yet there are people who are doing well and are making money. And I think that, I think you've hit on a good point that, uh, uh, it seems more fundamental to me than sure. turning journalists to go back to editorial boards where they can't do their work yeah. right? because they're owned by somebody who wants the paper for a political purpose. And one of, one of the one of the things that I when I hear that when I uh, and I hear it often when I'm working with journalists overseas, they what is lacking very often is some way of publicly embarrassing that oligarch or that ch that manager who is too chicken to do something right. What, what they lack is an American Journalism Review, a Neiman Reports, a Columbia Journalism Review, Quill Magazine, all these associations, uh, they show solidarity for the journalists, but they also expose publicly someone who is, has all the trappings of being an independent, in, independent media. Of the economic interests of the owner, particularly during election season. Uh, but but uh, the, the economic issue is an issue. I do not want to minimize it, but it's not the most important issue, as I see it, uh, in regard to what the journalists can and cannot do. Yes, they're paid badly. Um, yes, their jobs are always in danger. Uh, the editors and the managers are making enormous sums in some cases compared to the, uh, you know, uh, foot soldier, so to speak, um, the commentators even more. Uh, but that, again, is a cultural thing. This is, this is how it's always been. The commentator, the star, uh, will make more money. And the commentator, of course, is not always practicing journalism, practicing an opinion kind of journalism at the, at the very best. Uh, but that is cultural. Uh, but I, I don't want to poo-poo the, the economic uh, uh, factors. Uh, they're in play. Because, uh, I mean, you pointed out the Gazetta is an exception, Gazetta de Borgia. Well, Gazetta de Borgia is an exception for a number of different reasons. Sure. But if you, if you look at Poland, then it's not just Gazetta de Borgia. You can also look at Rzeczpospolita, for example, uh, who has better journalism and a different pedigree than Gazetta de Borgia. So if you move from country to country, you can find the Gazetta de Borgias or the Rzeczpospolitas to a lesser or greater extent, depending on which country you go to. But those are exceptions. Yes? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just as a follow-up to, to this, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of actually a comment, I think, because I come from a, uh, from a project, from the newspaper I work for, which is actually a product of, uh, of, a, of, of training, in a way, because we had to start a newspaper uh, and use the technique of uh, reporting that wasn't there and uh, there were people from the Wall Street Journal uh, who were teaching us so it was, it was a, it's a case study uh, and actually we were very successful this is a successful example of 
how you can plant a certain technique and it would work and it did mm -hmm. and since we started with now after 11 years I, I can report that um, most business reporting is Russia in Russia is done the way we do it basically like mm -hmm. you 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 have to make calls you have to talk to both <coughs> sources if there are if, or you, you have to go anyway so so the tools are there and yeah. you can teach them yeah. and and we're a living example but one thing is is sort of the overwhelming is is that you something that you cannot change is the institutions and 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 for example the uh, the TV channels that, that are now state-owned and state-controlled, they are institutions that used to be resources before, this, the, before the demise of the Soviet Union, and they remained resources, essentially, that the government or big businesses see only as a resource. And it's, it's, something, it, it's something that's really tricky. It's something that I don't understand, and I want... I have been trying to understand this actually by uh, listening to, uh, to by by taking courses here. How you make institutional change, and I don't. Well, they even even they don't understand those who teach that. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really like it sounds like you know one day you have them, next day you don't, or you change them by some kind of miracle. Sometimes revolutionary. Sometimes uh, they just I don't know. Now that your newspaper essentially get an in-kind contribution from the Wall Street Journal and uh, the loan of an expert. Well, you said you were advised by uh, the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. I assume that they made an in-kind contribution. Well, they, invest, they invested in. They oh, invested yeah, in yeah, the paper. yeah. We were. So they were, we are, we are still one, yeah. they So own, they were part owners then. They, they yeah. own one third. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, they are <coughs> so they were making an investment in themselves. Yeah, yeah. There was, uh, and now they, are, they continue to be a shareholder. It's actually a profit. Uh, so, so it's not just the training. What you're then describing is also a uh, a, a media. Uh, joint enterprise venture. that uh -huh. plays according to different rules. Well, yeah. So that's yeah, why. yeah. But okay. uh, and and by the way, that's not that's not always true because we've seen foreign media go into Eastern Europe and buy up a lot of newspapers and radio stations mm -hmm. and, and and TV yeah, stations, and they have a tendency to go native uh, and just say, yeah, okay, just make me money, but do it your yeah, way, the way you've always done it. And, Absolutely, I, if it works, or they fail. Right. I it's mean, Gannett, Gannett I believe, uh, went I in Eastern Europe. Probably a unique pro or rare example. Probably because this mostly we're talking about reporting on business. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and this is probably the subject where mm -hmm. you really need uh, yeah. some standards. Yeah. And, and and the market yeah. very, the market learned. We we could see how the market was learning very fast. That it actually was more profitable for them, for the companies, yes. play, players in the market, yes. to talk to us in a civilized manner, not try to influence or, or buy uh, coverage or doing all the tricks that they've been they've been doing for years. So they realized it would be more profitable to play by the rules, and so we introduced some rules, very limited ex way, and then essentially what I'm seeing now that we. Uh, we we are standing in front of the wall, and this is the the the, for, the institutions uh, that somehow transformed. But essentially, we have all the communist, former communist, ideological, and government institutions that became corrupt. That where there used to be ideology, now we have essentially. Uh, money seeking, greed, and that's it. That's what happened. So instead of Sounds like a Western value. Yeah. 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 Economic yeah. 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 That's right. that's what we have time for only one or two more questions. Yes, you have the last question. Perhaps that's an idea to to follow up on is if 
there is a business incentive to have Western style journalism in the East, then there's a chance for it to succeed because then the owners have that incentive to maintain the high standards of journalism. Um, yes, there's a German author whose name is Offe, I think can't remember what his first name is, and he suggests that the only way to change Eastern Europe, this was in the 1990s, was just to invade them. <laughs> well, I think they did before. Okay. It didn't quite work out. Well, I have one more, one, two recommendations which I think might enhance the opportunity for uh, democratic communications in Central and Eastern Europe uh, or anywhere else. Uh, one of the things that uh, recently passed at the FCC uh, was something called the uh, um, Local Community uh, Broadcasting Act, which was for low-power FM, uh, with a one-watt one, uh, radio station uh, and connectivity to the Internet. Uh, anyone uh, can uh, probably reach an audience anywhere in the world, but certainly in their own communities, uh, which is maybe two or three blocks long. Uh, the other thing is to promote uh, uh, ubiquitous, universal high-speed broadband, uh, which is the means of getting the uh, low-power uh, broadband, but also empowering any individuals who have an enhanced voice, which they may lack now. Uh, in the terms of ownership, uh, uh, that would sort of dissipate uh, part of the control because, as A.J. Liebling is alleged to have said, a free press belongs to those who own the presses. And with that, uh, yes, thank you. Go uh, ahead. Well, I, I don't think it's necessary to uh, conclude anything, but I'd just like to emphasize some of what Stefan had said in terms of how journalism, not just in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but throughout the world, uh, is a very dangerous profession, uh, particularly investigative reporting where you're uh, investigating uh, powerful institutions, powerful people, of powerful uh, government entities. And uh, when you embarrass or threaten uh, power like that, they often strike back by any means, including uh, the taking of lives, destroying the property. And uh, Stephan and I had had a conversation uh, about uh, the provision of uh, insurance, and he said that um, some uh, countries are making that uh, demand and they're actually getting it uh, from uh, some foundations. Uh, things like life insurance, insurance against kidnapping, um, um, let's see, liability, health care insurance as well as uh, for uh, wrongful uh, injury. And uh, that might uh, assist uh, emboldening some of the investigative reporters. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Bob to uh, thank you all for being here. Well, thanks to our moderators and, and panelists. Thanks to uh, the others who have presented uh, today, thank you all for coming. Thanks to my team here that put this program together. It's a lovely afternoon. We have a reception out on the patio, and we hope you'll all join us. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.